Mr President, uh, I rise today to speak on this bill and I'm quite uh, thankful to the other members who've spoken. It's been really interesting to listen to contributions and I've uh, noted that so far no non-government members of any stripe have been able to stand up and give unqualified support to this bill. Uh, I thank the points that have been raised already by other members. I'll try not to go over things in too much repetition but pick out the things that I felt were important to reiterate and add into the total of the debate. Mr President, quite frankly, I'm disgusted at having to participate in this rank exercise of cynical self-serving political theatre from the government. I'm appalled, actually, that on this topic, which has such serious consequences for the safety and wellbeing of Tasmanian workers and the success of Tasmanian businesses, that the government has chosen to play act at policy making and legislation. And while in reality it's clearly indulging in an exercise in petty political point scoring for electoral advantage and at the blatant expense of hard working, vulnerable Tasmanian workers whose interests they falsely claim to be serving. Mr. President, this matter could have been advanced and settled seven years ago if the government had chosen to put forward well-conceived, well-drafted, fit-for-purpose and constitutionally sound legislation at that point. Better protections and effective laws could have been in place for the past seven years. But the government clearly put ideological virtue signalling and cheap political point scoring ahead of the safety and wellbeing of Tasmanians. And instead, what we've seen is seven years of uncertainty seven years of Tasmanian workers and businesses left in the lurch, with no additional protections or legal support for their safety or wellbeing. Seven years in which the Tasmanian government has wasted the time and good work of public servants and wasted considerable public money in defending a law in the High Court that was so bad it was described by one of the justices as Pythonesque. We've heard from industry bodies and representatives who spoke passionately about the devastating impact that some types of protest action have had on Tasmanian workers and businesses. And I feel for those Tasmanians, Mr President. Hearing emotional stories from people personally impacted by threatening and violent protest actions is heartbreaking. These people have clearly been traumatised by their experiences and they just want those kinds of protests to stop they are not necessarily looking for more effective responses. As they say, it's too late often by the time the police arrive, the damage has already been done, the trauma caused. They want a greater deterrent effect for it not to happen in the first place. Mr President, I particularly feel for them because this government has not, in good faith, put their interests ahead of its own political ends. There are industry bodies, who genuinely want the best for their members and workers. They've been rolled out as cheerleaders by the government for this piece of legislation that on all indications will not achieve the specific outcomes that those core Tasmanian people wish to see, an end to extreme protest actions, because the legislation that we're presented with remains so questionable, it may well face the same fate as its predecessor and be struck down leaving them in the lurch once again. Mr President, most of us will have sympathy for the people and businesses experiencing trauma from protest action in their workplaces and businesses that are having their lawful business activities disrupted. We recognise that our laws should protect the rights of people who are undertaking lawful business activities. At the same time, most of us will also express support for the important principle of the, a right in a healthy democracy for people to engage in protest activity. We recognise the need to protect and ensure this right in our laws also. We recognise that our complex task is to balance a suite of rights in an appropriate manner. Mr President, this bill does not do that. It's broad, it lacks clarity and sufficient balancing provisions. We have to remember that this bill isn't just about one form of protest or one protest organisation even, much as the government might like to highlight 
one kind, for its own political purposes. Extreme protests involving violence and threats are causing harm that needs to be addressed. But that does not excuse the government for putting forward a bill that goes much further than, the, than that particular form of protest action and has much broader implications for other non-violent protest actions, which indeed are the vast majority of protest actions. This bill has implications for all of us, all of us here, our families, our workmates, our community members. It's important to remember that we can't conveniently divide people into two camps, workers on the one side and protesters on the other. It's politically convenient to divide people into us and them, to pit people against each other. But I suggest that many, if not most of us here, have engaged in various forms of protest in our time and may well engage in further activities in the future. Mr President, protest is a normal and healthy part of a liberal democracy. In fact, it's essential. And it's the only way we've seen progress made on a whole range of important issues that affect all our lives. Without protest action occurring in times past, I would not be standing here today in this place, literally. Protest is the valid mechanism by which people who do not hold power or do not have ready access to participate in decision making make their voices heard. Protesters are people, citizens, who care passionately about an issue on which they want to see positive change. They are unable to access or influence the decision making on that issue through formal structures, so they engage in an action to be seen and heard and express their view on what needs to change. In many cases, protest is a last resort for citizens that care passionately about an issue and have not been able to successfully access, participate and be heard through the formal decision-making processes, such as parliament or the political system. Mr President, the vast majority of people who engage in protest action are regular citizens who care passionately about a better outcome for their community. They protest because they feel an urgent sense of civic duty, civic duty to take action to see that better outcome realised. Even the tiny cohort of protesters that engage in extreme protest activity and who may be characterised by some as ratbags who are just trying to be disruptive, even those protesters are motivated by an urgent sense that the wellbeing of our community, our state, our planet, requires change to be made. When citizens feel the need to protest, it points to other avenues for civil discourse being broken or too limited. An escalation of an extreme form of protest points to a serious break in other avenues for civil discourse and influence. Mr President, some have noted an increase in extreme protest action here in recent years. I put it to you that protest does not happen in a vacuum. It occurs within and is a product of the social and political environment. Any escalation in protest action can be linked to what is occurring in the social and political environment around it. Some members have spoken about the previous efforts of discussion and negotiation that went into the TFA. That process and that agreement made a change to the social and political environment that resulted in, at the time, a de-escalation of protest action. Members have talked about their disappointment and frustration at those efforts around the TFA being lost and the resultant escalation of protest action and the very real and negative impact that some of the extreme forms of that are having on our state. I'd remind members here that this Liberal government took the disruptive and damaging action of ripping up that TFA. This parliament then, as a whole, supported that action and passed legislation to facilitate the end of the TFA. Members in this chamber voted to support that legislation that brought about that end. Indeed. Actions and decisions have consequences. Votes in this place have consequences. Discarding the efforts on all sides that went into the TFA overtly changed the social and political environment on issues related to forestry in this state and have, has provoked an escalation of protest activity. Mr President, let me be very clear. In saying this, 
I am not endorsing any particular instance of protest action, especially protest action that's violent or threatening. I am merely highlighting that protest doesn't happen in a vacuum. And therefore, if you want to look at effective ways to address extreme protest action, we have seen clear evidence in this state that bringing people together to discuss and negotiate, bringing all voices into the decision-making process is effective. We have also seen evidence in this state that threatening to crack down on extreme protests, discarding efforts of discussion and negotiation, empowering our legal system to broadly quash protest action is not effective. It creates an escalation, not a de-escalation. This parliament, Mr President, has the power to affect the social and political environment. It's done so in recent years to both positive and negative effect through its legislative function. We're faced with that opportunity again here today. Evidence tells us that passing this bill will have an ultimately negative effect in exacerbating extreme protest action. The exact opposite outcome that we have been pled to deliver by the stakeholders in our community who need us to act. Mr President, it brings us back to the issue of balance, the balance that must be found between the value of dissent and protest against the value of public order and safety and undertaking lawful business. Our job is to ensure that the government is doing its job balancing these two roles, protecting business, protecting civil rights. There are legitimate concerns that this bill, there are legitimate concerns that this bill doesn't do that. Government have made election commitments and says this bill is to deal with workplace invasion style protests. That was the election commitment. But the bill itself goes far beyond those commitments. The government hasn't just toughened up fines and jail terms for current trespass and property crimes. They've created new offences. Government says this law should protect people who are undertaking lawful activity. But they've elevated this above the even more fundamental principles of civil liberties and a healthy liberal democracy and got the balance wrong. This bill ignores that there are already laws in place that provide such protections, which may have been strengthened and extended to serve the intention here. We've had sufficient concerns raised. Members have, all members have spoken of those to some extent, which have been discussed in detail here, which give us pause on the lack of balance that we find in this bill. We've heard legal experts, including the Law Society of Tasmania, express significant reservations about the broad nature of this bill and the likelihood of it capturing benign protesting behaviour. We've heard from many expert stakeholders that the current laws we, are, we have are adequate to respond and could possibly be strengthened in their current form to give effect to the purported intent of this bill. We've heard about the impact that's possibly going to be put on police, the police force, in terms of the lack of clarity and the weight of discretion that that puts on them. It has been put to us that amendments in this bill only compound the confused nature of the original act. Mr President, we've clearly heard that workers and businesses affected by more extreme protest actions, sometimes involving threats and violence, want those protests to stop. They recognise that by the time there's a response from the police under current laws or indeed under this proposed law, the damage is already done. They are looking for a deterrence effect. That's the impact that they are looking for from legislative efforts here. Will this bill stop extreme protest action from occurring? Will it provide that deterrence effect? Will the new offences created here substantially deter people who undertake those kinds of protest actions beyond the deterrence that's already there in existing laws? Evidence tells us, Mr President, that they won't, that this bill will not deliver the outcome sought by those Tasmanians who've made entreaties to us for the protests to be prevented, to be stopped, to be deterred. In fact, evidence would suggest that this kind of legislation, this kind of bill in particular, will have the opposite effect of exacerbating extreme protest activity. It will throw fuel on the fire. Which is not to say, Mr President, when we're thinking about the impact of this bill, that it wouldn't have an impact 
on other non-extreme forms of protest and wouldn't have a deterring impact in those places. While it's unlikely to deter or prevent extreme protest activity, there is every indication this bill will have a chilling effect on more benign, non-violent protest action and all political expressions due to fear and uncertainty that it leaves us with and leaves our community with. This likely impact is not the outcome sought. This likely impact was not in a commitment taken to an election by the government. This is a fundamentally anti-democratic impact that erodes the civil rights of our community. In the absence of guaranteeing the agreed outcomes that were sought, this erosion of civil rights and the strength of our democracy is an unacceptable outcome. It is not an appropriate balancing of these rights. Mr President, a question has to be asked. Why has the government not brought a fresh bill with considered provisions addressing these fundamental issues? In response to the High Court decision, this government has introduced this amending act amendments to an act that was deemed invalid by the High Court. But despite these sub proposed substantial amendments, the breadth of the operation of the amended provisions continues to not be appropriate and adapted to the legitimate objective. Compatible, it is not compatible also with the constitutionally prescribed system that we have here of representative responsible government. Given that the bill imposes criminal sanctions and modifies a, rain, a range of common law freedoms, including freedom of speech, association and movement, clarity and accessibility should have been central to its drafting. And yet the bill remains unbalanced and unclear. It, focuses, it continues to focus on the rights of business without any commensurate concern for civil and political rights. The bill should clarify that citizens have the right to associate criticised government and business and express their political views. It doesn't do that. It's a fundamental rule of law principle that the public are, should be able to understand what rights and duties they have and which of those rights and duties are to be altered or to be taken away by any given law. The lack of clarity in this bill goes against this principle. <coughs> Mr President, a number of issues with the proposed amendments in this bill have been discussed by this parliament as well as, and as, well as by legal experts who have spoken to us uh, in many, many times already. I don't want to re go over too much ground that's been covered by other members. I'm just going to mention a couple of p particular issues about details in the bill. <coughs> the first one is that the amendments that we are discussing, the in this amendment bill were done in response to a High Court uh, finding that the previous law was invalid. What's happening here in these amendments is a movement away from reference to protesters because that was a key issue in the finding of the High Court, that it couldn't be targeted at protesters as in the explicit way the previous bill was. These amendments then are removing the word protesters and removing specific reference to protest from the bill, which is an overly simplistic drafting decision because it doesn't actually remedy the issues of discrimination that were identified in that High Court decision because it does little to actually remedy the practical operation of this bill, which will still be focused at protesters and protesting activity. The purpose of the bill remains to be on a prohibition of protest activity that affects business operations. Removal of the explicit reference of protesters hasn't remedied the operational discrimination that's there. So I believe there's still problematic aspects in regards to that. The second thing I'd like to talk about is the choice that was not taken with this opportunity to amend the provisions and provide more defined and clarified definitions and to really uh, provide a scope of this bill that balanced rights appropriately. The lack of clarity as to when an individual might be in breach of the provisions of this bill is likely only to serve as a deterrent and a chilling effect on potential future communication on government and political issues and protest activities of a benign nature. We look at some of the elements of the bill that do that that lack of clarity. 
the, to the defining of impeding a business activity. Impeding a business activity is broadly defined in Clause 3, to prevent, hinder or obstruct. The definition doesn't offer clarity of the necessary materiality or physicality of the threshold of that. You need to intend to threaten or intend to impede, both of which are difficult to prove. No time or place is attached to the threat or its effect on the business activities. It's not clear that actual damage needs to occur to the business activities or what the level of damage should be. We have to infer that the lack of clarity will have an impact on people's choices and activities and an impact on the discretion that's needed to be brought by police. Not having a clear threshold on what damage or disruption needs to occur to activate this scares people from exercising their political voice. That's the chilling effect I've mentioned. Puts police in a difficult position to know what the threshold is to, to apply the law. We also see provisions extending to public spaces and thoroughfares. The inclusion of the new provision in this way means that in effect anywhere in the public domain and in some private spaces like easements, are thoroughfares for the purposes of the amendments. Rather than determining a clear definition around particular, say, forestry or business sites, the government has instead decided to cover all their bases by including all public spaces. Beyond this, they've removed any time or location linkage between the offending activity and the business activity in question. This lowers the necessary obstruction away from business but to public spaces, and it's problematic. There's a new offence, a new provision of threatening in this bill that proscribes threatening to commit an offence against section six in relation to business premises and business vehicles if the person intends by so doing, by threatening, to impede the carrying out of that business activity on the business premises or in the vehicle. The threatening offence is an offence that's overly broad, it's speculative and entirely uncertain in scope. We've heard this from numerous experts. Confusingly, the offence apparently requires two separate intents in relation to the same crime. The intent to impede by threatening and the threat to do the act itself, which must also possess an intent to impede the business. Or at least, if that's to be clarified, clearly enough expert people are finding the lack of clarity confusing on that, on that part of the bill. This provision around threatening is not appropriate and adapted to a purpose in this bill, but it's overbearing and it's beyond the purposes of the Act. It seeks to charge people with offences without any damage needing to have occurred. Rather, the offence requires it merely an intention to impede by threatening, uh, to, by threatening to commit offence under the previous section six. As with other provisions, the offence lacks temporal or geographic elements that may be committed at any place, apparently including online, and at any time. Furthermore, the provision around threatening has not been included under the Act's given exemptions that we see in Section 6. So unlike Section 6, and confusingly, it would appear to be possible for a person to be charged with the Section 7 at threatening offence where the conduct which he or she is threatening to undertake forms part of a lawful activity that's been exempted in section six, it's not exempted here. Given the clear potential to impact on the freedom of political expression, the level of ambiguity within the provision, particularly in relation to its scope and application, raises problems that could well lead to difficulties for the bill down the track where we depart it. Section seven is a problematic pr provision and I think it needs to be rethought entirely. That's just a brief mention of some particularities in the bill that I think are problematic. Others have covered off in more detail about some of the other areas and I don't want to be too repetitious with those. But basically, those concerns I've raised and ones we've heard from others in this place are relating to the form, the breadth and the clarity of this bill. They've not been adequately answered and addressed by the government in what's been presented to us. I would also mention that we've had reference in the second reading speech and, and in, in fact a lot of public material on this matter that the government has put out, that the government um, wants us to understand that this legislation is simply aligning us with other states and with the Commonwealth in some manner. But it's doing nothing of the sort, Mr President. The three bits of legislation from other jurisdictions cited in the second reading speech are all much more discreet and or balanced than in this bill, than what we see in this bill. 
The Commonwealth Act that's talked about is about incitement to commit a crime. So it's not about expanding the scope of crime or making it more severe. It explicitly includes a balancing provision for freedom of political communication, unlike this bill. The Queensland law mentioned is very specific. It relates to dangerous devices used in protest, and it's about police powers to remove them. Now, that's a very targeted and specific response to particular kinds of dangerous activities, very appropriate. The reason that's targeted and specific, and unlike the bill we're presented with, doesn't capture and bleed into other legitimate benign process places, is that Queensland has a Charter of Rights. Queensland has to balance and measure its proposed legislation against its Charter of Rights. They are guided in getting the balance right by that charter. That's why we see appropriate targeting, effective lawmaking. And while we don't see that here, it's a great uh, tragedy, really, that Tasmania doesn't yet, not yet, have a Human Rights Act in this state that would provide us with similar guidance in our legislative efforts. A Human Rights Act in this state would be a very positive uh, contribution where we would have an agreed and respected set of rights that would assist any government of the day in developing policy and legislation that would appropriately balance and protect rights for Tasmanians. The New South Wales Bill is the third bill that's mentioned in the second reading speech, and that's quite specifically about interference with agricultural land. Again, it's targeted to a particular problem. I believe it relates to leaving the gate open in some respect. And it explicitly didn't try to replicate the trespass offence that's found elsewhere in, their, in the New South Wales laws. Mr President, overall, to try and paint this bill as being in some straightforward way, bringing us into alignment with some national approach on this issue is simply misleading, utterly misleading. There is no other jurisdiction that has taken this road and risked this breadth and lack of clarity that we see in the bill. No other jurisdiction has done that. We could look to other jurisdictions. I'd encourage the government to take a much closer look at other jurisdictions and see how they have gone about targeting, solving particular problems with targeted and balanced legislation. Let's go down that path. Mr President, in conclusion, for seven years, I think the government have acted in bad faith in the development and the progress of this bill. The first bill and now this bill. Twice now in the past seven years, we've seen them ignoring expert advice, neglecting to meaningfully engage with all affected stakeholders, curtailing appropriate parliamentary debate, wasting time and public money, and entirely failing to achieve the outcomes the bill purports to seek. The government have used this bill as a political tool, part of its ideological weaponry, to be deployed to wedge opponents and score cheap electoral points. And through all that, the government has let Tasmanians down. It's let Tasmanian workers down. It's let Tasmanian businesses down. They have left Tasmanian workers and businesses less protected and less safe. And on top of that, they have actively fostered a political environment that increases tensions on contested issues. They've discarded and destroyed past efforts at negotiated peaceful resolutions on those issues. There are more targeted means of achieving the desired end of protecting workers, but the choice that's been made rather has been to pursue this piece of legislation that is broad and lacking in clarity and risks our civil rights. Further, in the absence of a human rights protections in this state, and with no explicit balancing provisions in the bill, it carries a high risk of chilling political protest, benign political protest, by creating confusion and uncertainty in the Tasmanian public. These amendments in this bill should not be passed, but rather the invalid bill, which they seek to amend, should be abandoned and a fresh approach taken that is targeted, clear, and more effectively balancing of all our rights. Mr President, this government loves to crow about the many things it won't apologise for, 
Well, let me put on the record some of my own when it comes to this bill. Mr President, I won't apologise for wanting strong democracy that balances fundamental rights. I won't apologise for listening to expert advice. I won't apologise for expecting sound and proportionate legislation to be presented for consideration in this place. And Mr President, I won't apologise for expecting a government to legislate to genuinely deliver safer outcomes for Tasmanian workers rather than play act for political advantage. And finally, I certainly won't apologise for being disgusted by the government's self-serving political theatre at the expense of vulnerable Tasmanians. I cannot support this bill. The question is that the bill be now read the second time. The Honourable Member for Wyndham.